here. I'm one woman. I'm like now work at Silicon Valley. I've never spent more time learning freaking. And hey, by the way, I love, love when you send me an email going, hey, Maureen, I thought that that picture should have been a little more to the left or a little more to the right. Do you understand you are making my head explode? This is all experimental. We're doing the best we can here. Now, what I want all of you to do is start a stupid, <laughs> smelly share party. That's what I want you to do. And I want to tell all your friends to please support me at uh, Venmo or PayPal, Mo Langen, okay? Mo Langen at gmail.com and at Mo Langen. So here, I'm just putting start. I'm hitting a lot of starts. Right. And I'm saying watch party. Yeah. I'm oh my, my God, I was mentally ill. These are my daughter's glasses. How's that? Because you're all wearing glasses. Now I have to shut off the volume so I don't have to be stuck in a room with myself. I'm going to head back to the Zoom with my good friends. Um, and what I want to say to you folks before I introduce my great, great guests, because they're my buds and I love them, great lineup this week for you. Great lineup. Tomorrow, Tom Cotter, first comic to ever get to the finals in America's Got Talent. Wednesday, the crazy, the insane bread and milk guy, my friend Vic DiPetetto. And Thursday, comics who do not want to kill their kids, even though they may want to. They're trapped alive with their kids. That's going to be hysterical. That? Karen Burgreen. Veronica Mosey and um, Carrie Louise. And on Friday, we have Hell Gigs with Leanne Lord and Harris Stanton. He likes to sniff shoes. It's disgusting. Um, but here's what I want to say to you guys. You know, for seven years, I was on Bloomberg, seven years on KGO Radio, and I talked in a three-hour talk show, everything from politics to, uh, you know, helping people in the community to ridiculousness, gay news, who's in your vagina, dishing the dirt. Um, I don't want to do politics on here because there's so much crap and we're aware of it 24 seven. I can't take it. Like I literally can't take it. So what we're gonna do now is we're going to inject sunshine. We are going to metaphorically bleach the darkness within our souls and okay. we're gonna connect with you. And we're here to have a good time, you guys. And we wanna hear from you on the dot com. I'm on the dot com. Look at this, you guys, I have no idea. Look, I don't see my, my feed, but it doesn't matter. God has a plan. I wish he had a better party planner. So without further ado, I bring to you my good buddies. Uh, she has won every freaking award. She's a performer, a comedian. She sings, she does impersonations. She was a producer at The View. She Much. talks really fast and I got her to slow down to join us. Angela LaGreca, ladies and Thank gentlemen. Thank you. She said to me, don't mumble. Those were her notes. Don't mumble during the Zoom. <laughs> this will well, be a mumble, through. Mumble, mumble free Zoom. You'd be like, Maureen, okay, I'm coming to the house. I'll call you later. What time is it? Yeah, okay, get it, get it, get it, get it. And yeah, it was a, do you know I did a commercial for Fast Talking once with John Mashita, the Fast Talking guy? And you know what happened? I he didn't want, well, I'll tell you, well, you want to introduce Jim and I'll tell you the story. I would like to, but that's up right. to you, Anthony. No, no, no. You're no, trying no. to control me. Um, Jim David, you, he mm. kills me. You are one of the drollest, driest, <laughs> eye rolling comics, and I double over with laughter when I watch you. Jim David, everybody. Hey. He was a consultant for Queer Eye for the Straight Guy. Can't wait to get to all of that. I didn't know that. Well, we're gonna, oh, we'll and you were, at, uh, you were at the taping of my Comedy Central special in 2000. You remember that? Me? Yeah. <laughs> yes, but you where were, were we? We're, it was in Manhattan. It was at the Hudson Theater in Manhattan. Yes, I do and remember. Gave me at the, that was my Comedy Central special taping. And yes. you gave me the best compliment I've ever gotten as what a comedian. You said, that is, after, my, after I taped my special, you said, that is a guy who knows, a comic, who knows exactly who he is. I said that? Uh huh. I am such a astute person. Yeah, and I didn't feel that way at all. I was just flying blind. I was just, you know, really? whatever the hell. I was like, I'll try this, I'll try this, I'll try that. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't really know what I was doing, but evidently I fooled you. Well, you do know what you're doing because whatever <laughs> overtook you knew what it was doing. Um, all right, so part of the reason, I wanna get into the fun things that have happened in our career, but we all know um, this, whether you wanna hear it or not, you guys, love the white guys, got three brothers, got a father, was married to one, and dating one, like white guys. We are in a business that, just the truth, there is a type of person that gets more uh, rewarded than others. And it tends to be, if you look at any club lineup, it tends to be the white guy. And I know white guys are like, oh no, there's no room for me anymore because we have, uh, you gotta let in the chicks and you gotta let in these other people. 
But you know, when you come into comedy, you think you're going to be in a world of evolved, self-actualized creative people. You do? Uh, and you are, well, I did. Um, and some are, and then, but you know, navigating your way through a business where you go in and you're told gash don't sell, and that's a 1920s slang for vagina, or called the C word by an MC, go, hey, I've got another C here to get on stage. You realize like you're not in Kansas anymore or New Jersey, like Hiawatha. So the reason I invited, for many reasons, Jim and Angela today, is fantastic performers who happen to be gay. And um, Jim, you have talked very openly Side about- Side salad. <laughs> uh, Jim, Good. I just wanna hear the hurdles you've had to come through. You're a really brilliant comic who has had a lot of success. Um, Comedy Central special, million other things. Tell me what it was like, how it's been like, how it may continue to be like for you as a performer. When did you begin, what, you know, set it up for us. Uh, I, I, I think I came out on stage in 1998, I believe. I think, because I've been doing it since 86. So I, I seem to recall that I did it for 14 years without mentioning anything like that. Really? And one night I was, I was, I was just at the, uh, at the comedy cellar and um, I was listening to all the guys talking about how they broke up with their girlfriends. And I thought, well, I'm in a better relationship than any of them. I've been with my husband for 32 years now. Mm. And, I, and I said, I want to be able to talk about that. And then I thought, well, what if somebody throws something at me? And I started talking about, I, I wrote some jokes so that I could come out to them subtly, you know, and... Um, how do you do that subtly? Like, how do you... Subtly well, the, the problem is, is that you have to come out to the audience every single time unless these days i can just casually say well i was my husband blah 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 yeah and i've been with my husband 32 years but that's still coming out to them they assume you're straight if yeah. they do, unless they know better mm -hmm. but anyway i i came out and i thought the sky would fall it didn't the audience woke up and they were like what what did you say you know oh because they hadn't heard it before when i came out in that time there were only about four of us there was Kate Clinton, who was the first, uh, and then there was Bob Smith. May he rest uh, in peace. Yeah, may he rest in peace. He was the first. He was the first out gay comedian to have an, be on the Tonight Show, and he, had, he, he was the first one to have an HBO special. And then there were like Leah Delaria, I think, and then there was me. And now, I mean, the the next generation of comedians, um, there is a thousand gay comedians um, openly. I just work with one of them who's 31 years old and his whole generation is that whole generation of comedians where you mentioned white guys. I like that, white guys. <laughs> now, no, but now it is diversity is the thing. I mean, CBS just had a diversity showcase that all these young minority comedians were on. If you were a white guy, you couldn't get on that showcase. You but see, then that's unfortunate too, not to have that, like to cut that out completely too. You know what I mean? Like, right. I, I get we've been cut out for so long, but I also think too, it should be everyone. I would say if you go, went to a zoo and it's only one animal, you're like, this not a zoo. It's like yeah, right. Animals. But I mean, you know, it's, it's, these like things happen. Things. <laughs> but these things happen. They happen naturally. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Nobody actually came in and said, "All right, we're going to go with this." Just evolved. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do know what you mean. But anyway, when I, to, to answer your previous question, when I finally came out, it really helped me in some regards. I mean, when I came out, when I, I talked about, I did gay material on my Comedy Central special, and I hadn't even planned to do it until the really? day of. No, I, wow. I, I was like, I had to call my parents and I had to say, listen, would you be upset if I came out to the entire world on <laughs> national television? <laughs> and then my father said, well, you know what? Everybody I know is pretty much aware of the situation, and uh, I don't care if the whole world knows. You go ahead and tell them, bud. That's, That's what great. my father said. Yeah. He posts, Jim posts pictures and comments about your dad. And yeah. I, get, I get like, I'm actually getting choked up thinking about what a beautiful relationship you seem to have through the face. With my parents, it's great. Yeah, it's I love great. watching I talk to them it. every day. They're 92 and 90. Yeah. God, love them. Yeah, and I told them they can't die this year because I can't give them a funeral. I said, you um, have to stick around. Okay, yeah. Hey, you guys, if you're watching right now, I'm talking to Jim David and Angela LaGreca. Please share. 
click share um, if you're watching this on your feed. Um, just click share from my feed. Where the hell are you watching this? I don't know. On the dot com. Share it. Encourage people to have watch parties. We really want to get people on board with hanging with Lang. And, and shameless plug, I, I, this is, these are free shows, but if you want to support, you can do so at Ben Mo, at Mo Lang and, and at uh, PayPal at Molangan at gmail.com. Um, so you know what, Angela, I want to talk to you. You tell a story, and we'll get back to how, what that was like to be out on this stage for yourself, as you talked about, Jim, but also the reaction among the other comics and how you dealt with that uh, in the boys' world. Angela, now I want to hear your coming out story. I'm a bit well, familiar with it, but do tell. Well, I, I was not out in life or on stage for the longest, longest time uh, for many different reasons. None, none of them that I'm really that proud of, but, uh, mm -hmm. but for me, they made sense at the time. And also fear is a great thing uh, and a terrible thing, obviously. Um, you know, and I, I was, I came out because I had a child with my ex who gave birth to her. So it was like, I, I was working at the Today Show as a producer at the time. And I was afraid, you know, that was, in, how was I, I, had to, I took people in groups and I, I said, I have to tell you something. And they didn't like, what's, what is she gonna tell us? And I had to say, you know, I'm gonna be a mom and I'm gay. And I'd sat next to these people for eight years and you would think, oh, they all knew, but a lot of them did not know at all. But they never asked good questions either. You know, I don't know what they thought. I what was just kind of this, question? you know, I mean, you go to the office party, even when I was at The View, I worked at The View for eight or nine years before I went to the Today Show. The only person I told uh, was Joy Behar. And, and I'm telling you, I threatened her. I said, I don't care who the hell you are. I'm half Sicilian. I will effing kill you My if you tell anybody. My boyfriend is all Sicilian. And she, she kept that for the long, and I was working as Meredith Vieira's producer. I left The View, went with her and never said anything to me. Meredith. I didn't want to say anything to her. And at the time I had just gone through a breakup, my longtime 16 year relationship partner. And I didn't want to tell her that because I wanted to focus on doing a good job for her. So I was just all like a big bottle, bottleneck, you know, mess. But your daughter's um, and I was, only how old now? Six years old. So but yeah, very, compart very well, not nobody. Like there was immediate, I came out to my parents when I was 30, which is not that long ago. Yeah, which was a while ago. But I, I came out, I came out to them because I felt I was in therapy which another thing you weren't allowed to do in my family, that was like going to see a chiropractor. That's not a real doctor, you know? So it was like, why do you go, what do you need to go to a therapist for, you know? What do you need to tell anybody, pay somebody to tell your problems to? Know, you I talk know. to us and I'm like, but if you're the problem, what are you talking about? It's just, you know, in Italian families, you can't do anything. Well, how about Irish families? What the heck are you doing, shaming the family, yeah, sharing yeah. this, airing our laundry? We like, couldn't even go, I couldn't even go outside. Without a clothes dryer, we have to air our laundry. You know what, I have a, I have a joy story similar. I, I said, I was at the um, Comedy U, which was the club on Grand Street. Oh, yeah. That was a great club. Where I, that's where I started. And Joy was a regular there. And uh, this is long before she was famous. And, I, and my parents were in town, and they were coming to the show. And Joy was there. And I said, listen, Joy, my parents don't know I'm gay, so don't tell them. And then my mom, Joy said, yeah, yeah, sure, Jim. I'm going to go up to your mother and say, it's nice to work with your homosexual yeah. son. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, I, I you know what it is, it, the only, people say oh, it's no big deal, especially in New York, you know, right. like, or in, on any coast. It's like, it's no big deal to anyone outside of it if you're friends with them. But if it's a big deal to you, and for me it was, I had a lot of, and I, the thing is, that's, I had a lot of messages that were like, do not do that. Do my, I love my family and I love my parents and my dad's still alive, he's 91. But I mean, it was like, when I came out to them, it was a whole to do. I mean, you know, it was, I, I went to this therapist who said, you know, you're going to live with integrity. You'll finally feel as though, you know, you have an honesty with your family. So I sat down with them while they were listening to La Boheme. I really had to pick like a dramatic moment, an opera. Mimi's dying of consumption. And I decided to tell them, excuse me, I'm gay. And not only did I say that I was gay, I just, I talked about not that I slept with so many people, but I talked about anyone who I'd ever slept with. Oh, this oh, guy, that good. my Throw mother that was in. horrified by part of that. You slept with that Tony Orlando? Slut. Yeah, <laughs> no, so I, and they, there was just so much information at once. I just did a giant splat. Then they made me go to this priest. There's a seminar, a sem seminar, a seminar, should be a seminar, a gay seminar, how to come out. A seminary in uh, Yonkers. I grew up in Westchester. And they sent me to this priest and I had to go talk to him. And then he had this whole, you know, you know how my parents went there and said what I was a, such a good student and all these things. And now this. And then, you know, he's, I, I, I kept trying to be polite. I was not militant and, just, you know, I wasn't even taking a right to it. I was trying to be respectful, but questioning. Like, I don't understand if we're all living, we're all part of God's image. Why, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't some of these people be gay if they're part of, we all, God created everyone in his image and loves everyone. And finally, he said, you know, he said, you know, marriage is for procreation. And I said, well, what if 
people don't you know want to have children straight couples don't want to have children or they can't and then he said you act as though it's you know that homosexuality is is, is like a privilege or a mandate and he finally said to me and jim you'll appreciate this i think especially well maureen's heard it already uh he said homosexuality is a grave misuse of one's genitals <laughs> No, it ain't. And I realized a couple years later, like you know, Anthony no. Weiner is the grave misuse of one's genitals. Come on, give me a break. Right. No. So I, you know, I went back. Misuse, yeah. A grave misuse of one's genitals. Yeah, that's a. I couldn't make that up. And they handed me a pamphlet that said the um, the pastoral care of homosexuals in the church, kind of like a look, don't touch, like when you go to an all-you-can-eat buffet, but you can just look, but you can't have any other food or the dessert. And, I'm uh, so lucky. I got none of that. Yeah, no, I was really pretty traumatized. My parents are church-going Christians and have yeah. been all their lives. I think they were, they were yeah. like, I got none of that. They were, yeah. I mean, when they came out, yeah. when I came out to my parents, they were like, oh, well, we kind of knew. Um, yeah. And my, <laughs> like my father said, you know, when my, I told my dad, he said, no kid. And I said, well, why do you mean you knew? And he said, son, you're 33 years old. The only woman you've ever mentioned is Barbara Streisand. That was <laughs> exactly. <laughs> anyway. but so, it depends what families sorry. you grow up in, though. Like, you have a very supportive one. I grew up in a big Irish Catholic family, one of six. And I was separated from my husband for two years before I told my family. I only told one sister because the judgment around it, I thought. Yeah. I thought there'd be judgment. Like, what the yeah. heck is wrong with you? Ah, uh, you know, bottle up your feelings. Don't tell anybody anyway. Ain't nobody's business. That would be my father from the Bronx. When I told my mother, she was like, why didn't you tell me? You held it yourself. <laughs> I'm like, because I don't know which side I'm going to get of which people. You know, yeah. you don't. Well, it's interesting, don't... You talk about, it's interesting you talk about the judgment. I mean, once I, once I came out, I did not care what yeah. anybody thought. I that's honestly great. did not give a But that's so great. See, and, I, I, and that's I think one it... of the reasons why. That's one of the reasons why I would sit at the comedy cellar table and and spar with all the other comics, and they would give it to me all these anti-gay comments over and over again, and I would come right back at them with something else. And I said, "Look, I'm not the one who's going to grow up to be an alcoholic on his third wife, and his kids are going to hate him." You know, <laughs> you know it's what I mean? That's why. That. <laughs> that's why. That's why um, Colin. That's why Colin Quinn cast me on Tough Crowd. Yeah, Colin Quinn, because I could handle it. And the only homophobia that I really experienced was on that show from some of those comics. They would say horrible things to me backstage. Yeah. Well, you know what, too, uh, regarding that show, two things. A tough crowd, for those of you who don't know, Colin Quinn, who I think is, a, I don't think he's like those other guys, but maybe he is. No, um, he just, not. he had a like show him. with these comics. We like these, these are good guys, they're comics. But um, they would rip each other. They weren't going after material or, or highbrow uh, intellect. They were going for the base bottom line. So I remember I could hold my own on that. I knew I could. I wasn't on it. I have three brothers. I mean, believe me, I can say, shut up, sit down. I got this. Um, but the booker at the time, uh, Jeff Singer, was like, you're so sweet. I don't know if you'll be able to handle this. You're so sweet. I'm like, do you know me? I'm a nice person. But mm. who ever say she's so sweet as if I'm a delicate. Uh, well, it, oh. yeah, that's part of being female and part of what you're doing. But for me, it was different. And then Jim, in a way, because obviously, well, I started as a singer, really, and then started to combine comedy later. So being a singer, it would be like, I remember people would go like, what are you doing comedy for? You got nice legs. Go put a dress on and sing. First, you would get that. Really? And I, were, I started at the comic strip with a male comedy partner, and we were doing sketches musical things. The duplex? Where did you start? At the comic strip. Oh, the and comic I remember strip. Lucian, but he didn't pass us at the time. The first time he didn't, he passed us at Paulson's Supper Club, which is now, it was the triad, I forget. I remember it was a whole thing. But I remember at the time when we would do our little sketches, you know, your little comedy sketches. Your little um, joke. Um, your little skit. Your little skits. You're doing your skits. But I remember Rita Runder at the time was, was one of the few female comics. And I remember they would say, and now coming to the stage, and it would be like this anomaly a woman, you know, and it was a big deal then. So for me, I, you know, I was singing at weddings and bar mitzvahs to quit my full-time job in a sequin dress, which was like being a drag star. <laughs> it was my RuPaul days. Um, and, and, you know, and so that was the first thing I was doing just to make a living. And then finding your voice as a comic, you know, to really be truthful. I, I feel like only in the last five years did I even start to do anything that really meant anything. I was- I think it took well, me 15. Yeah, I, th I mean, I, I did a lot. Maybe, I could, could get away with singing. I've been doing it 34 years. I've been doing it 34 years yeah. and it took me about 15 to really say, yeah. okay, this is what I do. Do you know what I mean? I didn't really know. 
Yeah. I was. And you have to like, you have that right attitude of that big effort, you know, like you have to have that taking not just a right to it, I think, but you have to just not care what people think about you. And you have to you. know when though, when you're not afraid of it. I remember when yeah. I feel that I first got into my voice, I was so frustrated. I just got back from Atlantic City. It was a pig fuck. It was just stupid. It was drunk people. I had had it. And I went up at an open mic and I, somebody goes, Maureen, go up. I don't want to go up. I, I can't talk about all that stuff anymore. I'm done. Yeah. And I went up and I'm going, and another thing, you know what? These douche, and I can't take it. And another thing, and another thing. I'm like, oh, an anger. There we go. There it is. Put it up there. You have to, as a comedian, you have to have a, let me put, let me put it this way. You have to not care at all what the audience thinks. Yeah. You have to, and Alan King, Alan King was a, a friend of mine when he was alive. And you probably knew him too, Angela, right? From the From, Friars Club. Yeah, I knew him too, Friar. yeah. Yeah, and Alan was, we were up in the, the, the bar one night and I, was, I wanted Alan to tell me about what it was like to open for Judy Garland for seven years. Right. He, I mean, he was her opening act yeah. at the Palace on Broadway and at the London Palladium. And he said that she was so petrified before she went on stage she would stand in the wings, like at the curtain, while they are playing some the overture, clang, clang, clang <laughs> with the trolley, somewhere over the rainbow, right? And she would stand there backstage and while they were playing the music, go, fuck them, 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 oh, and then wow. walk out. <laughs> wow. Ever since, and ever since he told me that, and I don't remember when it was because I don't remember when he died, but, Ever since he told me that, before I've gone on stage, I say, fuck him. And that's not a defense mechanism yeah. as much as it is a, I've got this. Well, let me tell you guys this story. Um, you'll, I've shared it before on Hanging with Langan, but we all know Joy. I, Angela, you know how much I love her. Before I opened I just, for her for eight years. Eight yeah, years. Before I Many start, car rides to Atlantic City. and Yeah, yeah so before I started doing stand-up, I would tell you, oh, man, I love Joy. And you'd be like, I know, I got it. You love Joy. So... Um, I was, I had opened for her a few times and uh, she was a nervous wreck backstage, which surprised me. You know, I just didn't expect, she's like, how come you're not nervous? You're not nervous? I go, well, I probably would be, but you have enough for both of us. And then the MC, you know, of the, the sound of God, you know, they uh, introduced me. Ladies and gentlemen, Joy has brought a special friend to open for her tonight. Nobody knows who the hell I am. They're like, is it Rosie? Is it Whoopi? Who could it possibly be? And they're like, Maureen Langan. And the audience is like, what? And I walk out and I go, look, you think you're disappointed? Come on, well, let's just deal with this. <laughs> I mean, you know. But it is yeah. funny to see people who are, you know, nervous. But I think it's, but I think it's important to be nervous. Uh, uh, yeah. If you don't, if you're smug and you think you got this, that's when you can bomb. I mean, fuck you can them. bomb anyway. Fuck them. Fuck them. You know, fuck them. Joan Rivers was like that. Joan Rivers never let her guard down. Or Carol Burnett as a, not so much a stand-up, but as a, you know, when she would get up at some of those cabarets when she was younger, I remember hearing about that. And yeah, I got to work with them when I was at the Today Show just as a producer, but, and also met them. But, but yeah, I think it's healthy. I think it's well, healthy. Yeah, I just meant it was a, a lot of it, a lot of nerves. And I thought, wow, because they're there, they love you. Like, yeah. I'm the one who should be so nervous. They don't know me. You know what I mean? Yeah. They're like, who's she? And yeah. but, but you she, know, Joy opened for Buddy Rich, the drummer once. And I remember she told me a story where she said she, she, she said she just died a death when she went out there. She just faced like a thousand people with drumsticks on drum pad and they're hitting the drums and they're going, ladies and gentlemen, and we'll be with Buddy Rich in a second. But now Joy Behar and they're just were like, Buddy, Buddy, Buddy. <laughs> I mean, you know, we've all had our nightmare gigs, so, you know. Oh, God, I opened, I, I had to perform at a hospital benefit. <coughs> Excuse me. I performed at a hospital benefit, and I had to follow a quadriplegic uh, yeah, saying you... you'll never walk alone. Oh, God. No. I, I did that no. at the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. I had no. to follow this woman who was talking about her, it was crying hysterically. Ladies and gentlemen, now the music and comedy of Angela LaGreca. And you're like, really? <laughs> Take my colostomy bag, please. That's I mean, like, it was that's like Bruce Smirnoff. You know Bruce Smirnoff? Yeah. yeah. He, he performed at a, at a United Jewish Appeal benefit, and he followed one of those black and white movies about Auschwitz where they're dumping the bodies in the, in the <laughs> ditches. <laughs> I did this gig with the Irish people came over. The Irish people came over. They're like, Maureen, we want you to do some material. Your mother's Irish. She's all right. And then they do this film about all the Irish kids with like they, you know, the cleft palates and no teeth and roofs of their mouths. I'm like, it does. You're kidding me. Like, oh, kidding me. I performed at this so gig. I, the biggest bomb I've ever had in my career, I think, was I was the headliner of this benefit for Equal Rights Washington in Seattle. 
They flew me and Dan out there first class. I had a big thing in the program. It was like a big deal. This woman got up as part of the program and showed a short film about how she lost her wife in a fire. It's <laughs> not funny, Sorry. but these are the things we deal and with. She, it, was, it, was a, it was a plea for marriage equality because she lost everything and you know she didn't get any of the wife's estate and the family came in and took it over. Did it she was get the ashes? Horrible, oh, okay. huh? Did she get the ashes? Oh. It was a, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> but it was a horrible, horrible thing. And then- How did you deal with it though? What did you do? I, I, just get the check. Just get the check. You got to get I the check got, first. That's just, why people I, get the check I, first. I just got through it. I just got through it. But they didn't like me at all. The oh, audience was no. not having me. And also I did this, I did a thing where I did an Indian voice, you know, like, welcome aboard, you know, something yeah. like that. And there were a bunch of Indians in the audience and they got mad at me. Yeah. And then you I- couldn't I, win. You couldn't I could, win. I, I couldn't win. <laughs> And it was the most PC audience at the time that I had ever had. And they just were like, I just wanted to, it was like, I, you could feel the, it was, the reaction was like, ha ah. ha. It's like, oh, that's, ah. a bad, that's a bad feeling. That's a way hard. bad feeling. My guests, Angela LaGreca and Jim David, two fantastic performers. They have something in common. They both love Cher. Oh. They both love Cher, big time. I didn't know I'm you not liked that huge fan. I no. like her. Oh, come fan. on. <laughs> well, you like to imitate her, I think. Well, who would you know? Whoa. I'm not well, a very good impressionist. Angela's a much better impressionist than but I am. He posted I can only do one impression. What? what? Obi Wan. <laughs> now that's a name I haven't heard in a long time. <laughs> but wait a minute. I actually once did. Um, no, but with Cher, you posted something recently on on the well, Facebook. I, I found it on morning. YouTube. I, I couldn't believe my eyes. It, so it's share with tell tell share with this clip doing, of Cher. I've doing done that. All the parts in West Side Story. And she was what the male characters too. She, she was the male. The so was, there were four of her on the screen dressed yeah. as a guy. Yeah. When, when you're a dead, dead, you're a dead all the way what? from your first cigarette. Whoa! I mean, it was like tonight. <laughs> <laughs> it was like it the was most beautiful shot I ever heard. Well, well, I want to see Jim do some of the parts because he doesn't yeah. imitate much. Then yeah. we'll get to Angela. Go ahead, Jim, do some of the parts. When you're a jet little man, you're a king. You know. <laughs> You're drawing the line, so keep your nose in the way she does. Well, hang on a side. Whoa! <laughs> she did, whoa! She did all the parts. But did you ever hear, one time I did a uh, show at 88s, and Matt Berman, who was doing the lights and sound, he's so talented, and he, went, he worked with Liza Minnelli. But at the time, he used to play the pre-show music, and he used to play Cher singing Gershwin. Did you ever hear that album? So no. there will come along, the man I love. Whoa! It's hilarious, <laughs> every bit of it. It's so good. It's like when Streisand did Classical Barbara, Remember when she did Classical Barber and she was singing uh, these French songs? Hilarious. I love that. Um, I love that. 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 Priceless. But this is I what I want to ask you, Angela. I love that. 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 I my daughter's birth mother worked for her. So she was her personal assistant for like six or seven years. And when she got pregnant, she said, well, Liza, Liza will have Liza be the godmother. Liza had always wanted to have a kid. She had um, unsuccessfully, she had a miscarriage years ago, a couple of times, I think it's stillborn. And um, oh so that was really, what do we have? So my daughter's Ava Liza. And the funniest thing is that, you know, two Catholics, two completely lapsed Catholics, two lesbian Catholics, um, had our daughter baptized in the Catholic Church. People said it couldn't be done, but if you tell any priest, Liza Minnelli is gonna be at the service, it was like five, six, seven, eight. I mean, it, it was immediately, <laughs> no problem. You know, I gave a little money on the side, and yeah, it was fine. And yeah, so she's, I have the certificate somewhere, and uh, that's really pretty much it, yeah. I so love she, it. And she was very young, I, I flew with her. Uh, because Nicole was already with Liza for two gigs in LA and San Francisco. I was nervous about flying with a three month old, but I did uh, go cross country with her. She had flown to Florida once and she was so good at, on, not only on the airplane, but then Liza wanted her. She said, well, I want her to come to the rehearsal and I want her to come to the show. And there's nothing like, you know, getting into like an orchestra seat with an infant, you know, and having six gay men next to you going, yeah. you know, yeah, I and that. I just brought like a pocket full of pacifiers and, Ava would wake up for the overture, dun, 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 and then she'd sleep through the whole show. 
<laughs> at the end, she'd wake up. She was like on cabaret hours by the time. But and she had her own. Yeah, she had her. Oh yeah, we had. For, she went to the rehearsals, and she had her own dressing room. Ava, she would go to the church and, for the baptismal oh, yeah. and hold yeah. her over the. the oh yeah, wow. I have the pictures. Yeah, yeah so. where? What church? Where was this? Uh, it was in Queens. We couldn't get. Liza Minnelli went to Queens to baptize. Yes, yeah, she did. Oh, the priests were very excited. This is wonderful. This is wonderful. Was her husband David Gesch there? Was no, he husband, wasn't. They weren't married. Her husband. Did, did you I get used to say that to me. She'd say, I thought I talk fast, but you talk faster than anybody I've ever heard. No, I, I, I do. Um, but do you yeah. still see her? Does Ava no, see she's her? In, no, she's in California now. And, um, you know, she's, I don't know if it really, I, I don't know what if she, I don't think she's performing. I think she did something at the, um, what's that big thing that they built in the West Side? I think she was at something the for that. I'm on a 70 second delay. I can't think of what it was. I'm going to do a commercial break now because this we is my livelihood these days. Um, <laughs> if you folks are liking Hanging with Langan, want to tell you tomorrow, Tom Cotter will be joining us. And on Wednesday, Vic DiPetetto, he's out of his mind. I've known the guy since- I love that his, video he does right. about Trump. It's great. So he does so many oh. rage-filled videos. He got to start with uh, the bread and milk one. He got to start, he was doing comedy for 30 years and then he did a rage-filled video and everybody knows him much deserved. Tom Cotter, great friend of ours, uh, first comic to go to the finals in um, America's Got Talent. So if you want to support, if you like what you're seeing, I'm bringing you these shows every day. I'm bringing you great performers, great people who I feel so honored take the time to do this. Um, I do sell shirts on my website called Don't Make Me Hate You. Um, they're really great gifts for people that you don't want them to make you hate them. And again, if you want to make a donation to Venmo at Molangan or PayPal Molangan at gmail.com, not necessary, but always appreciated. All right. So you guys, once you out yourself as a lesbian only five or six years ago, Angela, um, and Jim, you had uh, literally the balls to go on stage in 1998, right? And just say, hell, fuck them. This is who I am. Did anything change for you? And tell me how it changed in a positive way and maybe not so positive, Jim. In a positive way, I got gigs that I normally would not have gotten before. Mm -hmm. There were a lot, of, a lot of gigs for gay audiences. I started working on gay cruises, which I still do to this so day. Fun, right? Um, for the same company. Um, met, you know, enormous amounts of people that way and, uh, and broadened my fan base in a huge, huge way. Um, and uh, I got in the Montreal Comedy Festival on the That's gay show. It's deal. interesting. Montreal, see, Montreal, I don't know if they still do it, but Montreal, for the people watching who don't know what Montreal is, it's the Just for Laughs in Montreal, which is the number one comedy festival in the world. Huge, yeah. And, and they do it every year in several cities now. And at the time, when I first started going to Montreal in like 2002 or something, yeah, they had women's comedy night, gay comedy night, black comedy night, <laughs> Jewish comedy night, Latino comedy night, and then they had a bunch of white guys talking about how they, how they broke up with their girlfriends, and that was called comedy night. And But anyway, Bruce Hills, who was the head of the festival, he said, I'm glad you came out because now I can book you. Right. And I was like, you couldn't book me before? And he said, no, I, I didn't know where to put you. And I said, well, you could have just put me with comedians. How about yeah, that? Yeah. But anyway, once I, once I started doing their queer comics show, yeah. and then they put me on the galas, and they did other things, and then eventually they had me headline. You know, I went, like, I went there like four times. But um, those are the positive things. The negative things is a lot of clubs wouldn't book me anymore. Honestly. A good many. Oh, yeah. Yes, they would not. They said, well, why should we, you know, and like, because their audiences were all straight. And all of a sudden, they didn't know that I was gay until I told them from the stage. And so you, you don't do all my material about being gay at all. No, no, right? no, no, no. But I mean, even the mention of it was too much for some people. But see, this I mean, is the thing I'm telling you about. When you only give people one type of comedy, you're going to get one type of person in the audience. Right. And when you give people more from which to choose, you're going to get a wider range in, in audiences. Um, but if that's their audience, that's what their audience they want. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, I think they're seeing the value these days in expanding. Well, we'll see how that happens. Well, but no, I, I, was, at, I was at Helium Comedy Club in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And I uh, was talking to this couple up front and I said, oh, I've been with my partner for 15. They said that we've been together 15 years. And I said, oh, I've been with my partner for 15 years too. I met him, you know, 15 years ago. Immediately. 
when I said I met him. Some guy out of the darkness says, hey, is this a gay bar? I said, what? He said, is this a gay bar? And I said, no, uh, if you want to go to a gay bar, go outside, turn left, and go down the street, and there's a club called The Mansion. And it's like one flight up, and you can see the neon sign that says The Mansion. And then he says, oh, yeah? Well, if, 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 this, if this isn't a gay bar, would you keep uh, pushing your, would you quit pushing your gayness all over me? And then I said, oh, I didn't intend to ram it down your throat. Oh, <laughs> and then when I said that, the whole audience was uproarious and they were all on my side, of right? Course, yeah. and that guy got picked up by the security and thrown out of the club. And Good. the guy said, the guy, but the guy said, what the fuck is this? There's a faggot on the stage. Yeah. And so that, I had numerous reactions like that yeah. where people were like, how dare you? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because this was, see, this was not, there was no Anderson Cooper or, you know, at the time, there was only Ellen and she was off the air. But you talked yeah. about how you first started doing material subtly. I, I'm curious what were some of the first type of bits you did to out yourself as, as gay on stage? Well, I said, I've been with my partner for 15 years. And oh, then I said, I don't really know what to call him. If I call him my partner, it sounds like we, we're a law firm. Yeah, if I call him my companion, it sounds like one of us is a dog. <laughs> and if I call him my boyfriend, it sounds like we sit at home and watch Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which is a really good show. Yeah. <laughs> and I did it like that. You know what I mean? I would, I would sort of say, a bit, I, I just did it. now I do it in a different way because marriage equality is legal. And like I'll say, like if I'm doing an audience like in Vegas or Atlantic, you know, for a big, big, primarily straight crowd, they all yeah. are. And um, I say, uh, I say, well, you know, the those of you who are old enough will remember that the whole marriage equality for gay people issue took exactly the same trajectory as interracial marriage back in the 60s. You know, a lot of people didn't want that at the time. Yeah. I mean, my mother at the time, my mother said to me, don't you marry a black girl? And I said, newsflash, I'm not going to marry a girl. Yeah. There's a, <laughs> it's really a wheel of prejudice. It's, it's yeah, more of a ladder, I but know, I accept I will it. do that kind of thing. So but, but the uh, thing with Jim, you have to understand, is he's brilliant, and he's droll, and he's biting, and he's quick, and you don't stand a chance if you're going to come at him on stage. And kudos to you for what you said back you. to him. But that took a lot. That, I was really thrown at first. When, yeah. You know what I mean? I was like, yeah. I remember the first time somebody really heckled me. It was at Danger Fields. Oh, and but, been, no, that, that. that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, but I'd been doing comedy about two years or something, mm. and I was having a rough night. Yeah. And this guy in the audience yelled out, don't quit your day job. Yeah. And I just, I was like. Because <gasps> <laughs> it's jarring when you don't know how to handle it, right? You yeah. don't. I had yeah. a guy try to take off his pants. I was in Rascals uh, in Ocean uh, Township, New Jersey. And he couldn't handle that. There was a woman right up front. He, he was sitting up front. He couldn't handle there's a woman on the stage. He's yelling this sexist stuff out. And finally, you know, this is kind of a hack thing where you try to put them in their place. I was fairly new. And I'm like, you know what? It's always the guy with the littlest dick who shouts the loudest. Oh, you want to see my dick? And he gets up and he starts to undo his pants because he was loaded. And the security guards, because some comedy clubs don't have your back, the security guard, bam out mister well that you know the words a lot of, but a, that's been a that's been a long time thing where people feel like if you're a woman and you're doing comedy that's not your place it's still i think it still exists uh, to a degree i mean and there's so many more women um and obviously gay people and all kinds of you know now it's more ethnic but don't you think maureen there's still that there's I mean, still that thing if you look at um you know you still get that thing when you you know at the borgata i love working the borgata atlantic city come on and when women say it, especially I don't normally like female comics. And I, yeah. go, please. I go, please, please don't, please don't. You don't know enough to even, please don't. I, I can't. But I, used to, I used to do a lot of warm up stuff at The View, but the first job I had was at the, uh, Rolanda Watts had her own talk show, The Rolanda Show. And I remember once doing the warm up, and this guy came up to me, and he was John Wayne Bobbitt, who was a guest that day, it's a long time ago, lawyer. John and he, Wayne. Yeah. And he goes, John Not Wayne Bobbitt, Bobbitt. John <laughs> Wayne Bobbitt wants to go out with you. I'm like, oh my God, really? Where are we going to go? Benny Hanna? Sure, fine. I mean, it was like so ridiculous, but it was almost like this power thing. Like he came in and like, he was still trying to, and I, you know, not only could I, I not, I wanted to just said I'm gay, but instead it was like, even that I couldn't, yeah, like, couldn't, do couldn't that. give that as a good, that would have been a good answer though. You know, but, but he could have been the right kind of guy for you to date then. No. <laughs> You're right. 
But I asked crazy. you, I asked Jim, and I want to know from you as well, um, Angela, when you finally came out only six years ago, um, yeah. you're such a good mother, but by the way, um, do you, what, did anything change for you for the better or did you also have well, some repercussions? I feel like I don't work as much um, at clubs as I used to, just because my life took a tour and detour and, and not a good detour. And as a producer, I really, I was at the Today Show for eight years and really it was very hard to do jobs when you're working really late and getting up really like at four or five in the morning, Yeah, well, you know, and I enjoyed every bit of that. Um, and then it, so, you know, I think what happened for me was I went through a lot of things in a short amount of time. And so then it was like having a child, you want to live with integrity. Then I was divorced a year and a half later, like here, you come out to your parents and, you, and then, you know, and when you're younger and then you say, this is what's happening and you think it's all going to go in order and life doesn't care if you're no, gay or not gay, really or if you're out or not out, it's just going to take its turns. So for me, it was more about, not explaining, but trying to say, say, I'm a mom, but obviously, you know, I'm an older mom. So I felt it was almost like a way of explaining it, like my ex gave birth to, you know, kind of thing. But I, I didn't really use it much in my act. It was just more of like a, just being honest about that part. But I liked working on the coming out part and I'm still working on that. To what me, I want to work it into a one woman show. Well, yes. I, and what, I, I want to talk yeah. to you about that. What is, um, what was Meredith's reaction? Because you said, oh, please, she please. Has to be let great. me tell you something. And I couldn't love her more. I think she's the best person I've ever worked with or for. And I consider her a friend, but I, and I would say this to her face. I mean, she never asked me. And then I think what happened was we were all going to see Kathy Lee Gifford's Broadway musical and so Liza. Nice. Yeah. And Hoda <laughs> wanted <laughs> wanted Liza to be her date so they went in the car and picked them and Liza was just being Liza so isn't it great the girls are getting married and they're having a baby so she just like <laughs> outed me to Hoda who then said something to Meredith and Kathy Lee and all this great you know thing that I had been holding together for so many years just you know it was like the pandemic of the I of you know the orchestra for this show and next thing you know everybody I worked with kind of knew in a way it was kind of easier um so, so that was, you know, it was, so then Meredith, of course, was feeling like, oh, you didn't tell me personally. How could we work together for all these years? Uh, so she was, you know, she, we went to some restaurant when she was vegan for a few months, you know, like, like eating beige for a few months. And we sat at this vegan restaurant and, and I knew she was trying to get to it. And I just said, you know what? I said, get, get out of here. I said, who are you? I said, how many Emmy Awards do you have? She's like 15 or 18. I don't know, 18. I said, what do you do for a living? And she was looking at me and I said, you ask questions. Don't I said, you never asked a good question. And I put her totally, I, that was my way. That's our relationship though. You have to understand because I said, I did you a favor. I said, because when I came over to the Today Show, I would have just gone through a big breakup and I spared you because I didn't want it to be about me. And that is the truth. I just wow. buried it and just worked. And so, yeah, I said, and, and also I, when you tell somebody, at least when I tell someone, I, I may, I'm so invested then all of a sudden I want them to care. And I didn't want to have to have that relationship with somebody I worked for. Mm. necessarily so in some ways I didn't give her you know I didn't give her the benefit of it because you know and I talk so much and have and they want to be needy and so you know so it was like I so, so I made it like I did the right thing and spared you now well, of course we're of friends and we talk all the time but at the time it felt like the thing I needed to keep again I'm so compartmentalized that I'm good at that I felt well, like doing like the you're, job you're coming together it sounds like yes. you're bringing all the parts of yourself together. Well, you get old enough. It's like, you know, how yeah, many more years are you going to put up with this bullshit? These things, the, yeah. well, these things take time. I'm still working on myself all the time. I mean, yeah. this, uh, this isolation that we've been through for the last six <laughs> weeks has been an uh, enormous challenge for me. Yeah. You yeah. know, it's just been very, 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 di very difficult. Yeah. Because I like to stay, I like to hang out at home, but not at gunpoint. Not to be forced to, <laughs> exactly. And I'm still trying to figure out how, how coloring your hair is not considered essential. I mean, I just, find, you know, I finally had my color done last time. My ex how about this, Angela? You know, I posted. This, you know, we're doing what, you know, like Bruce Willis idiot. and Demi Moore are doing, only not a little more girly. You know, I know you don't want to talk about days. politics, Maureen, but there's this, the host of Fox and Friends, Ainsley Earhart, is that her name? I don't know her name. The one in the middle is with the short name? skirt. I think so. Yeah. Sounds, she is, right. sounds right. She's an idiot. And she said, like a couple of weeks ago, she said, look, I mean, I know people are dying, but we can't get our nails done. <laughs> and I just wanted to, I just wanted to go, oh, 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 I mean, oh, oh, kill myself. I, my, the only way I cope is to, I cook my way through it, because that gives me something to focus on. I'm and making, I work, veg I'm yeah. making vegetarian, veg, vegan Swedish meatballs tonight. Yeah, good. And Call Meredith. Call Meredith. Maybe she'll enjoy that. I posted on, on the dot com, on my Facebook page, on the dot com. And by the on way, the you guys, com. 
go over to uh, join the group page, Hang In With Langan. Um, I'm trying to merge the shows over there. Once I learn that, it could be three years, but just join Hang In With Langan. Actually, I'm doing a watch party there as well as on the timeline. I posted, I've never colored my own hair. I said, anybody help? Anybody tell me what to do, anything? And some guy posts a comic, goes, you know, you women, and you call yourselves feminists, and you want the right to vote, and you want to be politicians. I'm like, I could still want my hair to look good when I go into the <laughs> fucking voting booth, you asshole. <laughs> Sorry, I got angry there. It's angry. about feeling good. <laughs> look, it's hard Sometimes to Sometimes you, you have to let rip. I mean, uh -oh. you know, everybody's dealing on their own level. I mean, I think that we're not, I, God bless the people on those front lines in those hospitals. I mean, that's really what it's about. You know, I mean, you think about it. But, you know, the rest of us are still, everybody has different levels of uh, patience and acceptance, you know? Yeah, and, acceptance and, is the biggest thing. Yeah, it's very hard. The, Listen, the, I had a brother knowing, working at Kings County Hospital. Good, yeah. On my good days during this, you know, I'm, yeah. I consider myself to be a pretty relaxed, mellow person. Yeah. Um, but this has tested the limit. Yeah. Like, it's tested why, everybody. Limit. Yeah, yeah. And I gotta tell you, good, I'm on my good days, I accept what's going on. Right. I make a nice dinner. It's I, like a I, bad I, dream, though. But yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I isolate a lot, and I realize that part of this has not been so hard on me because I realize how much I do isolate, and that's been a lesson to me to connect more when this is over, because I love on stage or if I see people, you know, I, I'm friendly and I love connecting and chatting. Then yeah. I just can be alone by myself 24/7 when I'm not on stage. Um, so this is giving me an opportunity to create the show, all of that. What's cons and I will be more connected. I will accept uh, Corey Kahaney's um, invites for lunch and a drink. She's yeah. become a good friend and very supportive. Always has been, but I'm letting it in more. Um, the thing is, I'm worried about after here. That's where my anxiety is. Where will we make our living after here? The clubs count on, particularly we all work in the East Coast. We all live there. You need those tight tables on top of each other. That's what make cl makes clubs successful, that energy. Um, well, that'll happen when, when there's a treatment. When there's a treatment. This is, I look at this as a lost year. I, look, I, I, if you ever got through some life-threatening thing, and I, had, I had breast cancer five years ago. I was on chemo. Right now, I kind of, and I liken it to that same feeling, which is like you're scared to the bottom of everything, and you're like, what the heck? And you just hope you're going to make it. But, and I'm not saying this to be dramatic, but I, I looked at it as, and my good friend Lenny Babish would always say, and this is going to be in the rearview mirror. And I remember keeping that image in my head, you know, because I think, how am I going to get, and it really was true. And then one day, and I remember my doctor said, you know, a year out of, from your, you know, treatment and everything, you're going to feel, because you start to accept a level, you start to accept, like, we're staying in like this. And we're, we're forgetting what the sunlight is like and all the other, and the, the social interaction or whatever it is. And you're starting this new normal doesn't feel normal at all. But the point is, it's like a lost year, not that any day is a waste, but it's almost like we got to be patient and ride this out. It is not going to be forever. It will be a new normal. I, I do believe that, look, we've gone through other pandemics. We just happen to hit it in our lifetime. And, yeah. and I think that when they come up with stuff, we'll be better prepared. They'll have, but it will be a different world and maybe a better one. Who knows? I mean, maybe not. Maybe it's Well, you know what? You know what? One reason to be hopeful is you see how fast the earth is healing itself. Isn't that uh, something? I mean, Isn't that great? It's astonishing. I mean, it's like, the you know they show a picture of of Mumbai yeah. and it's mm. and it's polluted and yeah. smoky and horrible and yeah. then they show another picture of the same image now mm -hmm. and it's crystal clear. Yeah. But how and great if how are. great if how great if human beings could come out like healed and different? But that's that will last for how long? It's just like do you remember Dom DeLuise in uh, in the end was it Dom DeLuise? No, is it and um that movie when they think they're drowning and at the end and they start to realize they're going to make it they're making all kinds of deals with god they think they're right. not going to make it ashore and then and and then all of a sudden as they get closer they start changing their minds it's the same thing like we're all like oh if i could just have my life back and i'm gonna i'm gonna be nicer to people and all this other stuff is that really gonna last i don't know you know well, I, I don't know i'm not, so, I'm not sure that's the point but you know what i mean well I we'll see i mean in, in some ways people might learn from it but we need better see in order for it to really work we need better leaders that's it. We you need know, we a need, leader, we, a leader, some leader, a leader, yeah. a leader. Would Somebody. Be good. But how do you yeah, we look need at an that side? We need an inspiring leader. We need an inspiring leader who can put all that stuff together and doesn't just pull everything out of his ass. You know what I mean? Because that's well, all Trump does. He just pulls stuff out of his ass. My hope is promise. when you look at this environment, you realize I've had discussions with people. I don't even care. I'm not a scientist, but basic things like global warming. I go, have you been in a car, the greenhouse effect, basic science class uh, in high school. If that 
heat gets trapped, it can't escape a car. So if you have shit in the sky, it's holding the crap down and warming everything. I don't know. I don't need a degree. And people who haven't finished high school, they're telling me it's bogus. I'm like, now look at the sky now. Look at nature, like you said, healing. There's something to that, my friends, and we can learn a lesson from all of that. Jim, I did not get to ask you this. Um, you were a consultant on Queer Eye for the Straight Guy? On one episode. Do tell. I just want to hear what that was like. <laughs> it was the, well, it was the episode that where Kevin Downey Jr. was the contestant that they were <laughs> making. Tell him, that's a comic, Kevin Downey Jr. Kevin Downey Jr. Yeah, if you knew is what a comedian. Like, you would, you would evidently, his, his personal life was a shambles, his, you know, his, his, his skill at, you know, cleaning up was just awful. His room was a mess, his, just everything about it. And then they brought him into, they brought him into Caroline's and said, we have a comedian mentor for you. And it was me. And they called me in because I, I'm, I was, I was, they just asked me to do it. And I said, okay. And I actually mentored Kevin with his comedy act. And uh -huh. I said to Kevin before, I said, listen, I have, to, I have to say something. So what should I say to you? You know, I said, what, what should I say? Because I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna tell Kevin how to do his act. You know what I mean? I'm not gonna do that. But he said, well, why don't you just tell me to, you know, people have told me I need to be more myself on stage. stage so why don't you tell me that? So that's what I told him. <laughs> that's, that's exactly what I told him. I said, I wanna see more Kevin. I, I, I came on what very see stage. more Kevin? Yeah, I came, I came on very sage in the, you know, in the episode. It's really, it was just ridiculous. Oh, that's it was, fun. All of those shows are so rehearsed and so, of course. you rarely get us, I mean, you're making the stuff up as you're saying, but they edit it all out, you know oh, what I mean? They, yeah. they keep it, they only keep in what they have planned for you to say and like, mm -hmm. like on the, the Apprentice, I mean, all of that was, all of that exchange was, was not real, you know, and it's mm -hmm. all, on, on The Bachelor or on Survivor. They, I hate it, all those shows. All of, huh? It's, it's all, never, edu it's ridiculous. It's all it, edited. None of them. It's all, none and of it's them also produced. Them. I think a lot of it's I mean, really I did a joke where I said, reality, reality is not a bunch of gorgeous people on an island. Reality is a couple of rednecks arguing over paint chips at the Home Depot. Yeah. <laughs> That's a reality show. Yeah. Um, you know, Angela, you have spoken about wanting to put together your one person show. And I, <laughs> everybody I though, to, I know. Well, I got to work with you, you know, when we, I was doing the Don't Make Me Hate You shirt, uh, show. By the way, Don't Make Me Hate You t shirts, product <laughs> placement um, on my website, MaureenLaughlin.com. I, like those shirts. Um, I love these. Um, I know I have to promote the stuff because yeah. the income now is a comic. PayPal, Molangan at Gmail, and Mo Molangan. I don't know what to tell you. I want to get a blind dog and get a, a tin cup and sit on a street corner where the only technology I have to worry about is when the light's going to turn red. That's all I need to worry about. But Angela, you've talked about um, wanting to do your own one person show and having worked with you on, on my show, Don't Make Me Hate You, I got to yeah. see what you were working on. I think it would be a fantastic, honest, poignant, funny, show all of it yeah you know i go through pockets of like anything and jim you know this and maureen you know this like you need to put a lot of energy into whatever oh, you're doing yeah, you know and yeah. you know just being a performer a comedian a, whatever it is you know is its own full-time job and in a lot of ways and this is not an excuse but you know i do different things it's like full-on mom then full-on producing then working and 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 you know it's in some ways, I think it's distracting and fractured, but I think under it, you just have to make the time and room for it. You have to get up extra early. Sometimes I do that um, and work on your own stuff. You know, I, I tend to like to not work on stuff that's for me, even though I know it, that's what that's where my heart is. Sometimes I have to get that out. And so I just run a circle for a bit. And then eventually it, it will, it does come out. So I used to write, I used to really believe in pre-visualizing when I wanted to work certain clubs or certain venues. I want to work here, there. And I would see those things would happen sometimes. And I stopped doing that. And I kind of think getting back to that, I started to just do that recently. I want to interview this person. I work out, out at a public access TV station in East Hampton where I have a house. I haven't been out there, but I've been working remotely. And I say, like, I just make up a list. And I say, I want to interview these people. And then I kind of make that happen. And I think just, taking that time in a very busy world. We're forced now, right, to look at ourselves. Whether it's, I'm cooking this meal, I'm gonna make the best, you know, best meatloaf I've ever made. And whatever it is, I'm trying to do it fully. Where before, I'd like to spin and run around and then come back to center. And I think now it's more like, all right, get it done. Next, mm -hmm. get it done. Mm -hmm. I so I think it's about, I guess to answer your question, you know, 
And as we get older, what do you want to do with this precious life? That question that Mary Oliver, like this one, what are you going to do? You know, everyone's stuck now. What are you going to do? You going to, is it going to be about getting your hair colored? Or are you going to leave, leave some imprint for humanity? Or what do you want to do? What is right. it? And if you haven't done it, you should try to do it. I mean, it sounds so kumbaya, well, but, but I, I do think that way. Saying. I, well, yeah. I've always hit a brick wall when that happens because there's been, you know, uh, I, I, you know, for, I, I travel so much with comedy, you know, I'm on, I'm gone for right. like 25, I'm gone for like 25, 30 weeks every year. How and long? about, huh? How long? About 25 to 30 weeks a year on the oh, road. Oh gosh. That's that's a lot. Okay. Well, now, that's a lot. And, and then in the last several years, I'm like, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. I want to stay in New York. And then Dan, my husband is like, well, what do you want to do? And I'm like, oh no. I don't know. Yeah. And that was just putting pressure on yourself. What, like, I want yeah. to do, what I want to do is sort of out of my, it's probably not going to happen. What I really oh, want. Oh, visualize it. What is it? Well, I want to be, I would love to go back and be in a Broadway show again. I mean, what I did will one. You win? Do it. I did one. And I, huh? Which one did you do? I did a, I did a show that was uh, called The Best Little Whorehouse Goes Public. And it was Tommy Toon's last musical on Broadway that he directed and his first flop. So oh, it, was, it was the greatest experience of my life until the reviews came out. But you know, what, Jim, if that's your thing, you, you should. I mean, who's going to stop you? You have to. You have to do, pursue that. It's just like you know, the pressure's on in some ways. It. Like people say, like, oh, you know, and during the bubonic plague or whatever, when you know, when Shakespeare was, you know, there was the flu then and there was the pandemic. He wrote King Lear. Like that's a lot of pressure. Like, what did mm -hmm. I do? You know, I organized yeah. a sock drawer. I didn't write King Lear. You know, but, but, but at the same King token, Lear, but you're making <laughs> a good meatloaf. And the thing I've is, made some great meals. <laughs> and when I hear, Jim, when I hear you say it's probably not going to happen, that hurt me to hear that you say that for you. Well, because I don't see not? how it could. I mean, I, I don't why have why the connection. I mean, it, it, maybe. Happen. We'll see. Huh? Angela, Angela knows people in the Hamptons. Just I just the Hamptons. But, you could... <laughs> I'm just, but I'll tell you what, a couple things I've learned is, you know, I was a broadcaster for so many years, and I love stand-up. And for me... I did this creating this show while we're going through all this. It gives me a focus for the anxiety, but I'm truly interested in what makes people tick. And the other thing is too, the art I have around my room, a lot of it is from special needs people. Um, so I want to get more active, um, I, you know, to support the Down syndrome kids, the special Good. needs people. Those are things that matter. And I love dogs and I love taking care of fostering and all that stuff. So that's stuff that I want to do. And you realize when you're creating something, as you said, Angela, this show I, I 10 hours a day figuring out technology i'm like yeah but it gets it. easier i mean i give you credit because i want to do the same thing i've been starting to think like why well, i couldn't figure out the gallery on my on my zoom and now it's now i have it i don't know you know but it's like uh, it's all a learning curve but it's a good learning curve why not you know well let me ask you guys we're going to wrap up now um and tell people how they can support you or where you are or your you know the dot com stuff angela well, you could pay my mortgage, which is um, coming up soon for the beginning of the month. Um, I don't know. You could just, I guess, just be supportive in general of what performers are doing. I mean, I think, I think that's what we all kind of mean. I don't know what that means in terms of, you know, obviously to what you're trying to do is great. Um, and I don't know, to be supportive, I don't know yet. I, I think What's just your being- Can they follow you? No, no, you know, no, I, I, no, somebody no, stole my website. I had the first AngelaLaGreca.com and now it's like some locksmith took my name as I'm famous, which I'm not. I mean, I'm on Instagram, but I'm, that's pri I don't have an open, I guess I have to open up, I guess. You have might, an open you Instagram. might consider that. If you need to reach Angela, you know, just email me. Don't. On Facebook. <laughs> so, Call and, Maureen. <laughs> how do people follow you? How would you like them to stay in touch or not? <laughs> Who, me? Yes, Jim David. Oh, uh, on Twitter or Instagram, at Comic Jim David. C-O-M-I-C, Jim David. And um, I have uh, shows for you every day, Monday through Friday at 3 o'clock. Tomorrow, Tom Cotter from America's Got Talent. Uh, Vic D. Potato, The Rager, my buddy on Wednesday. Thursday, I have comics, How They Don't Kill Their Kids During the Corona. Karen Burgreen, Veronica Mosey, Carrie Louise, fantastic. Fine. Friday, Hell Gigs with Leanne Lord. Uh, she's brilliant. And Harris Stanton, who just kills me. And one more time, feel free to support at PayPal, Mo Langan at Gmail. I know I'm getting obnoxious, but some people tune in later. Uh, or Venmo, MoLangan.com. Or um, get a t-shirt for you, your friends, your coworkers. Don't make me hate you. They're perfect during political chats. Um, you guys, you know what? You took the time to join me today, and I feel honored. Thank you, Jim. It was fun. Thanks, Maureen. Yeah, Good fun. to see you, Jim. All right. Thank you, guys. Good to see you, Angela. Thank Bye. all of you at Facebook. Be safe.
Thank you. Eat well. Share with your friends. <laughs> yes. On the dot com. Join um, my Hanging with Langan uh, group page. Just keep sharing it. Have watch parties. All right, you guys. Thank you for all your support. I see all the comments today. Angela, I'll see you soon, darling. Okay. Thanks so Bye much, Maureen. Thank Good you. Good job. Bye.